Okay, I'm going to get started now. This is Welcome to the Dance Archives, How and Why to Do Research. And I'm just going to go over some housekeeping rules. Audio and video is muted for all attendees. Please submit questions in the Q&A box. And chat can be used for general comments and discussion. Today's session is being recorded for future viewing. And I'll turn it over to Hallie for more information. Hello, all. Hello and welcome to Welcome to the Archives. We are so thrilled that you are joining us today for a look into the hows and whys of exploring the magic of dance archives. So my name is Hallie Chemetsky, and I am the archiving specialist at Dance USA. I use she, her pronouns, and I am calling in today from stolen and unseated Lenape lands in what is now called East Harlem, New York City. For accessibility purposes, I am a white woman with about shoulder length brown hair. Um, today I'm wearing black and white polka dot earrings and a sort of black and white tiled top and I'm sitting surrounded by some frames. Um, first, I want to note the accessibility functions on today's webinar. We are very, very grateful to Antonio and Vernice from TRJ Bridges for being our ASL interpreters today. Um, so there is live ASL interpretation. The interpreters will change out every 15 minutes. So we will have a brief pause and conversation at those points, just so you know. Big thank you also to Tess from White Coat Captioning for providing live closed captions today. You can turn the closed captions on and off by clicking closed caption at the bottom of your screen and selecting um, show slash hide subtitle or view full transcript. Um, as another option for viewing captions, you can copy and paste the link that is going to be in the chat um, into your web browser. This will allow you to make the text larger, um, personalize text size and color and fit your needs that way. So I'm going to post um, captions about all of that into the chat. Um, there is a link in there if you would like to make use of that. Um, next, I want to acknowledge that all of the speakers today sit on occupied and unceded lands. And as we go through, each speaker will acknowledge original inhabitants of the land where we reside. As I said, I am on the land of Lenape Hokang. Um, we encourage you all in the audience to give thanks to Indigenous people who have stewarded the land which you are on and to seek out resources to make material connections and reparations with these communities. And I would also like to take a moment now to honor all of the lives that have been lost to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and to recognize that this pan pandemic has disproportionately harmed indigenous, black and brown and disabled communities. And also that the pandemic has led to increased bias and violence directed at Asian Americans. As archivists, we are committed to increasing access to information that can combat ignorance and bigotry and uplifting the value of all voices, communities, and histories. So now to give a bit more background on today's event and start diving more into the meat of today's conversation on dance archives, I will pass it over to Mara Frazier and Beth Cattleman from OSU's Theater Research Institute. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for coming and please enjoy. Thank you, Hallie. Hello, I'm Dr. Beth Cattleman. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman with short brown hair sitting in front of a blue background, and I am the curator of the Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee Theater Research Institute. The Theater Research Institute is located in Columbus, Ohio, on the campus of The Ohio State University, which sits on the unceded territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee people. The Research Institute was begun in 1951 and in 1986 was named 
for the famed Ohio-born playwriting team, Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee. The Institute acquires, preserves, and makes accessible materials documenting the performing arts for the purposes of scholarship, education, and enjoyment. I'm delighted to welcome you today to this webinar entitled, Welcome to the Dance Archives, How and Why to Do Research. And in just a moment, you will be hearing from some terrific dancers and researchers who have used their archives to support their work. But first, I'd like to introduce my colleague, our curator of dance, Mara Frazier, who will tell you a little bit about our dance collections. Thank you, Beth. My name is Mara Frazier. I am a white woman with long brown hair sitting in um, an office with a dresser and a frame and some objects on it behind me. My pronouns are she, her. I'm sitting on the same land that Dr. Cattleman mentioned in um, what is known now as Columbus, Ohio. As a dancer and performer by training, I did not realize early on that I would fall in love with the relationship between movement and its traces, whether that is in the form of verbal language, graphic notation, recordings, um, and then through that passion, really fall in love with dance archives. It is only through being welcomed by mentors in dance writing, in dance notation, and in curatorial practice, namely Dr. Cattleman and Nina Couch, who um, preceded me in curating the dance and movement collections at Ohio State, that I really even came to work in archives at all, um, something that I'm really grateful for. And through that, I grew to understand archives as a rich source of information, inspiration, um, and service. So I am just really happy that now in the permanent position of curator of dance, I have this mission to, to work with these collections. I, my mission is to build the collections, to preserve them, to activate materials and to share what is here with people. Um, and really to build connections across the field and throughout the region. Um, the collections at Ohio State in Dance and Movement are vast and really fascinating. We have the papers here of choreographers, for example, just some highlights, B.B. Miller, Twyla Tharp, um, we have the Marcia Siegel papers and um, the Marcel Marceau American collection, the Dance Notation Bureau collection, and the Charles M. McKay collection of exotic dance from burlesque to clubs, just to name a few of the really um, exciting collections that we have here. We maintain ties to the vibrant Department of Dance at Ohio State, supporting researchers, undergraduate students, um, and anyone really in dance who wants to interact with our archives. We are open, TRI is open for research during the pandemic. We have modified hours and we have been working really hard to provide digital copies of our materials um, as much as is possible. To browse our collections or to learn more about TRI, please visit our website at library.osu.edu slash TRI, and we'll place that in the chat for you. Or you can contact Dr. Cattleman or me directly, and we'll put those emails in the chat. Archives of performance are so exciting because they are living entities. Um, what I love about archives of performance is that they move and change as artists come and activate them. And I'm excited to get to share that with you today. Um, this event is a really special opportunity for us at TRI to collaborate with Dance USA. And we're also really excited to be able to, I'm excited to be able to learn from the Chicago Dance History Project and OSU alum, Janae Kutcher, and from the Jerome Robbins Dance Division at the New York Public Library and from our really awesome panelists that we have. So I want to jump right into the event. I want you to get to meet these amazing people that are here. So I will turn this over now to Imogen Smith. 
Thank you, Mara. And thank you to Ohio State University for hosting this webinar. We are honored and excited to be collaborating with the Theater Research Institute. And welcome, I want to thank all of you for joining us and listening today. I'm Imogen Smith. I am the Director of Archiving and Preservation at Dance USA. I use the pronouns she and her, and I am joining you today from the unceded lands of the Munsee Lenape and Canarsie peoples in Queens, New York. I am a white woman with long brown hair. I'm wearing a black sweater with a blue scarf, and I'm sitting in front of a bookcase with a leafy green plant on it. Dance USA is the National Service Organization for Professional Dance. We support the field throughout the nation. And the mission of the Archiving and Preservation Department is to help the dance field preserve and share its legacy by offering services, resources, and education to artists and organizations. We host a network for dance archivists and anyone else among our members who's interested in getting together and talking about dance archives and preservation. And we work to promote and amplify the importance of dance archives of all kinds. In this workshop, we want to elevate the diversity of collections that are found in dance archives and the many different ways that they can be used, not only to support scholarly books and articles, but for the creation of new works like films, installations, and performances. There have been so many wonderful projects in recent years that have animated and activated the archives and creatively re-envisioned what a dance archive can be. So we're really thrilled to be sharing a few of those projects with you today. We also know that archives and libraries can sometimes seem opaque or hard to approach. They can sometimes seem like gatekeepers that exist to restrict access to materials. If there is one thing that I would hope you would take away from this webinar, it is how much archives want people to use their collections and that they are here to serve you and to help you find what you need. Yes, archives do have certain rules and protocols that are there to protect their collections, but they will usually do whatever they can to accommodate you. And above all, archivists really love to help people do research and get access to information. So you should never hesitate to contact them, speak with them, and ask for what you need. I want to briefly share with you um, a new resource, the Guide to Archival Dance Research, which is free and available on Dance USA's website and that answers some questions you might have about getting started with archival research. We will also drop the link to this in the chat. Knowing something about how to search and how archives and libraries organize their collections, which can sometimes seem arcane, can help you save a lot of time and avoid frustration in your research. So this guide offers tips on how to start get started looking for materials and links to some search tools to begin finding where materials on your subject live. The guide also includes information about what to expect when you visit an archives or a research library to help you prepare and make the most of your time. People sometimes assume that these days anything you might need for your research must be digital and online, right? Not so. Libraries can never digitize all of the materials they have. So while they will often have a selection of digitized photographs, videos, and other materials on their websites, there is much more that you can only see by actually visiting the archives and looking at the materials in person, once it is safe to do so, of course. And during the pandemic, as Mara mentioned, many libraries are making a special effort to digitize materials on demand. This guide also provides information on how to contact archives, how to cite archival sources, some information about copyright and a glossary of archives terms. Finally, 
there is a list of some of the dance archives that are members of our archiving and preservation affinity group with contact information for professional archivists who are happy to respond to your questions and tell you more about their collections. So I encourage you to take a look at that guide and let us know if you have any questions or comments. Now, I am very excited to turn it over to our first speakers. So I will welcome Hallie back to introduce them to you. And we will be back to take questions later in the event. Great, thank you so much, Imogen. Yes, it is now my great pleasure to introduce Tanisha Jones and Rosalind LeBlanc. So Tanisha Jones is the wonderful assistant curator of the Jerome Robbins Dance Division of the New York Public Library, which is the largest dance archive in the world. Tanisha is elbow deep in acquisitions and management of dance collections, as well as um, managing the audio and moving image materials. She is an invaluable resource to researchers and artists, such as Rosalind LeBlanc, who she will be joined by in conversation today. So Rosalind spent over 20 years as a choreographer and performer, um, notably for today's event with the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company, where she danced for six years and continues to have a deep relationship with today. She has danced with many major choreographers and shown her work around the world. And she is now an associate professor and the current chair of the dance program at Loyola Marymount University. And you can read their full bios at the links in the chat, which I strongly encourage you to do. Today, we are going to hear them discuss the artistic and research journey at the New York Public Library, which led to the creation of Rosalind's new documentary film, can You Bring It? Bill T. Jones and D-Man in the Waters, which traces the history and legacy of one of the most important works of art to come out of the age of AIDS. So with that, I will happily hand it over to you two and please take it away. Thank you so much, Hallie. Um, I, my name is Tanisha Jones. Uh, I use the pronoun she, her. And I am calling in today from the unceded lands of the Muncie Lenape Hoking on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, New York City. I'm an African American woman with shoulder length black hair, wearing a white blouse and kente cloth hoop earrings. And I'm sitting in a room with two bookcases behind me with Christmas lights strung on them. Hello. Uh, thank you, Tanisha, and thank you, Hallie. Uh, my name is Rosalind LeBlanc. And I use the pronouns she, her. I am currently on the Tongva lands in Southern California. And I am in my son's, uh, my 13 year old son's bedroom, which he has graciously allowed to become my office during COVID. Um, I am an African American woman with short curly hair. And I am wearing a blue polka dotted blouse and a necklace with a mini broken glass ceiling that a friend gave me. And I'm very happy to be here today. Well, before I begin my discussion with Roz, I just want to thank Dance USA and the Ohio State University for this opportunity to speak today. I'm really excited about this. So thank you very much. And Roz, let's, let's get into it. I've been really looking for having this dialogue for quite a while. Um, you know, I had the pleasure of working with you and your production team as you did the in-depth archival research on your recently released documentary, Can You Bring It? Bill T. Jones and D-Man in the Waters. And the first question I have for you is, when was it apparent to you that you really needed to mine the archives to do the work you needed to do to create your film? Well, you know, that was um, apparent, I think, from the beginning. So I conceived of the idea of doing the film in 2012 when I was restaging uh, D Men in the Waters Part One at the University of Minnesota. And it became clear that um, I needed to contextualize the piece um, more fully because the students had uh, very little understanding 
uh, they had heard of the AIDS crisis and they knew uh, the surface of it, but very little understanding of the dynamics and the um, confluence of very, um, very, I would say almost opposing um, uh, 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 ideas and, and energies and experiences during AIDS. And so I wanted to contextualize that. Um, and I, having done the piece, had a certain amount of knowledge and, and of course, knew Bill T. Jones and knew the stories and, and knew the original cast. But I realized that I needed the archives. I needed the library. I needed um, all of the, 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 I needed to find the dates. I needed to find right. the locations. I needed to find that, that intricacy um, and detail, factual detail. And Roz, when did you come to find out that the Bill T. Jones, Arnie Zane Company archives had come to the dance division? I was just wondering about the process. You said that you conceived of the idea of the documentary in 2012. We actually acquired the uh, archives of Bill T. Jones, Arnie Zane in the summer of 2017. So I was curious about that journey for you. <gasps> Yeah, so it was uh, so there were a couple things going on, which um, so back in 2012 um, and 2013, when the project really got started, there was there was a certain level of, of um, archive that the library did have, like, for instance, um, we Damien Aquavella, who is D man, his his uh, oral interview, his right. audio interview was at the library. So I had been going there for those types of things. Also, there was an interview with Arnie Zane that was at the library already. Um, then I was going to the company itself, uh, the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Company and New York Live Arts, their home, to kind of mine their archives. And I didn't start to do that probably until we really realized what we would need for the film. And it was time. It was like, okay, now we know exactly what we need. Let me go to New York Live Arts and see if they have it. And that it was at that time that Kyle Maud, director of production, said to me, oh, we just gave our archive over to the library. We don't have anything here. Right. <laughs> and it was just kind of a panic moment of like, OK, can we get it at the library or did you just send it or what is it being digitized? What's going on? So. Um, it was so we contacted the library we contacted you and in fact you it was in the process of being digitized it was not yet available right right and the library bent over backwards for us which i am eternally grateful um in order for us to gain access well we were delighted to support you and we absolutely knew the value of the incredible work you were doing and I vividly remember like getting an initial email from you and your, um, I believe, oh goodness, Amy Shewell, who was your archival consultant. And it was sometime around like early 2019. And you know, you were at that point very knee deep in the work and were pursuing, you know, um, materials um, from the papers part of the collection. And the wonderful irony is that the materials had just been processed and they were ready, but they had not yet been delivered to Lincoln Center. So when I knew that um, your co-director, Tom Hewitt, and Amy Collins, your, your editor, um, were prepared to come on site to look at the collection, we were able to fast track the delivery of the papers to the library to support your research. Um, and I really thank uh, the library special collections processing team to help facilitate that and help us get those, those materials, you know, to you and to your, and to your production team. Yes, and it really was a bi-coastal effort. Uh, Ann Collins and Tom Hurwitz were based in New York and were going over to the library. I'm based in Southern California. And so they were uh, kind of texting me while they were there, letting me know like, oh my goodness, it's a treasure trove. Oh, we have found <laughs> it. It is amazing. The library is amazing. They, you know, they had their white gloves on to protect everything. Um, so it was actually quite, I will say this about archival research that it can be really exciting. 
you know, it, it is something that in theory, I think feels kind of can, can, can seem kind of staid. And I think a lot, for a lot of my students, sometimes it's just like, oh, I gotta, I gotta do research, you know, yeah. that it becomes yeah. this, but when you're passionate about a project, and you, it really does feel like kind of going into the attic and opening the trove, you know, right. and it can be very exciting because sometimes what you find is beyond what you ever imagined you would find. Mm -hmm. And it is the, it is just, it's, it's like it activates the project in such a tremendous way. Absolutely. And, sorry, go ahead. No, Rob, I was just going to piggyback on what you were saying about, you know, um, you know, like discovering these finds. And I was wondering if you could maybe specify one or two things that that, you know, either you didn't expect you'd find that you did find or that you were hoping you would find in the archives that you did discover. Yes, absolutely. So probably the most uh, kind of goosebump moment for me was um, we knew that the the dance D-Men in the Waters had won a Bessie in a Bessie Award uh, performance award in 1989, and we wanted to find the moment where you know we could just hear someone saying, and the Bessie Award goes to right. We were looking for that moment. And Tom Hurwitz had gone to the library quite a few times and was looking for it. And he said, I don't think it's here. I don't think they recorded it. It's from 89. I don't think we have it. And I just felt like it's got to be there. I, I just know it. It's got to be there. So when I was in New York City, I went back and um, I was sitting there by myself and I put in the right combination of keywords or something. Anyway, I ended up finding it. And um, I won't give it away, but it now opens our film. What I found opens our film because it gave me goosebumps. It was not only just that moment we wanted, which was the Bessie Award goes to, it was Bill T. Jones walking on stage to deliver his acceptance speech. And, and it gives you chills, and especially is so resonant in this time, in this COVID era, um, to hear him at the height of the AIDS crisis, what it meant to accept that award. So that was a moment I was practically crying actually in the library. It was so yes. exciting to find. Well, it is. Yes, Ross. Well, yeah, no, I didn't want to cut you off, but I'm, you know, I'm so moved because, you know, this is what archivists and librarians we experience is, you know, our researchers making these incredible discoveries and the emotions that come from this. I mean, this is particularly personal for you, Roz. So I could completely understand that. But, you know, Raj, you brought up a very interesting um, point, um, you know, in, in, in the discussion of Tom looking for that Bessie footage and you being able to find that Bessie footage. And you had specifically said, I put in certain keywords in the catalog. And that is something that can tend to be um, very challenging for researchers is, you know, depending on the particular interface of, a, of an online catalog that people have to use at any particular institution, you know, using the right things and knowing and, and knowing the right phrases to say to mine the information that you're looking for. How did you feel doing that, um, you know, in this case with the New York Public Library's online catalog, and how did you feel interfacing with the finding aid for the collection? Well, um, I, you know, in a way, it has a bit of a, um, a dance or logic to it. I don't know if that's intentional, but there is a certain amount that the more, and this is where as a dancer and as a performer, you really are a fantastic researcher and you may not necessarily connect to that. You may not realize that like, 
oh, every time I go on stage, I'm actually an archive in and of myself, you know, because yeah. I, I remember there's a certain level of recording that performance, that experience that's happening in that moment. You carry it in your body. So, so that I don't remember exactly what I put in, but a lot of times with finding the right keywords, it's almost about going in and saying, oh, I remember that was uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin. Let me try that. Bill T. Jones performance was <laughs> Kenosha, Wisconsin. I remember that Damien Aquavella was in that performance. You know, let me put that in um, and those kinds of things. So I think that that in a way, the artist themselves is is in a, a, a living archive. Yes. And you can activate that in the search in a way that someone who hasn't necessarily been on stage, who hasn't necessarily in that interacted directly with the work may not know. There are certain details uh, that may not be apparent. Exactly. You know, and, and I, and I, you, you, you said that so beautifully and, you know, what has always been a mission for us in the dance division is trying to make our catalog records and specifically our audio and moving image records be as comprehensive as they possibly can be just for the things you described, remembering, you know, performance, you know, um, places and maybe a venue, you know, or obviously a person that was in the cast of a, of a performance, those things that are incredibly necessary in order to, again, get the discovery and find the materials that you know you need and you know Roz I happen to know that you have a particular um interest in archives from a personal level I was wondering if you could speak to that in terms of your mother and father yes so my mother uh Elizabeth Walton she was one of the original uh, members of the Paul Taylor dance uh company the first black woman to dance with the company uh, for 59 to 66. And then my father uh, is a set designer um, and worked with Negro Ensemble Company and a lot of um, uh, early um, uh, kind of cutting edge avant-garde black theater companies. And my father, the library did a retrospective of, of my father's set designs among other black artists, set designers. Um, I can't tell you, it was in the 90s. I don't remember the exact date. <laughs> and then my mother, I, I would often just go to the library to see videos of my mother doing Oriole, um, doing early Taylor works, which, you know, were on, you know, film. <laughs> They've probably <laughs> since been digitized, but I used to go and watch them on film. Um, so both of my parents are there in the library, uh, so that feels rich. And I will also just like to add that um, one of the things about, you know, archives also in a way are these tiered or concentric circle um, type, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a very concentric activity in a way. So, so in other words, there's the person and then there's the, there's the artifact. And a lot of times going straight to the artifact is something that is difficult because the artifact doesn't interact. And, and so to go to the person first and then to the artifact, you know, uh, yeah. be, whether that person is uh, the librarian, the another artist who may have worked, uh, a dancer, a, who is that person that can help usher me into um the artifact and give me some of those keywords that i may not that's be right that's exactly right because you know yes to your point if it was something that you ultimately felt like you were having difficulty finding we are here as your resource to help you find that so you're absolutely that's absolutely right and, you know, Roz, I thought maybe if we had a little time, if we could also talk about the process that you went through to actually get the things you needed for um, the documentary, the clearing of copyrights and things like that through the library and, and that process and how you felt about that transaction. Yeah, well, that process is very um, daunting and yeah. rightfully so, because these are, uh, you know, these these uh, archives need to be protected um, and copyright. Uh, I'm a strong believer in respecting um, copyright. 
Um, so, so it, it, yes, it's daunting. I think that, um, permission, I mean, it is really about asking permission and making sure that you credit, um, properly, you ask certain permissions and there often is uh, a couple rounds of permissions. Um, we went through quite a few things where, uh, BAM may have, let's say Brooklyn Academy of Music may have shot the footage of Bill, but you know, Bill owns that footage, it being yes. his image, but also so does BAM, you know, so there, so right. there are these levels of permission that you just simply have to go through. I mean, there's, there's yes. no way around it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel, I mean, you, you and your team at uh, New York Public Library were uh, heroic not just in giving us access to the archives prematurely, uh, you know, before it was actually released, uh, helping us mine them, but then also letting us know this is the this these are the tiers of permission that will be needed, um, and so you know, good yeah. luck and come back to us <laughs> when you have it. But even just knowing, just the information to know who we needed to ask. And a lot of times that, you know, that can feel like, ooh, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get permission, but most of the time people do want to give permission. They want it out there. Yes, you know? that's right. That's right, Bob. <laughs> Allie, how are we doing? <laughs> you are doing wonderfully. I am very regretfully popping in to, <laughs> to thank you so much for, for speaking with us. And it's so wonderful to hear you both speak. Um, I could listen to you talk all day. Um, and uh, just so everybody in the audience does not fear, this is not the last you will see of Tanisha and Roz today. Um, they will be back at the very end for a Q&A with all of the speakers. So please do throughout drop any questions for anybody, any of the speakers today, whether it's Mara, Imogen, Roz, Tanisha, or the next exciting speakers we'll see into the Q&A. Thank you, Tanisha and Roz, and we will see you in a few minutes. Great, Great thank thanks. you. Thank you. Great, so it is now my pleasure to welcome Janae Kutcher and Matthias Kodat. Um, hello, both of you. Um, Janae is the founding executive and artistic director of the wonderful Chicago Dance History Project, or CDHP, which is a digital archive of original and collected research on the rich history of dance in Chicago. Janae is a remarkable tap dancer and has danced with world-renowned tap artists, as well as presented her own work around the country. And she is a true multi-hyphenate. She writes and publishes on dance, has made her own feature length documentary film. Um, and we are very grateful to have her here today. And she will be joined in conversation today by Matthias Kodat, who is an interdisciplinary artist and poet. He moves in his work between dance performance, text and print media, has published poems in multiple publications and collections and is a current company member with Ballez. Again, their full bios will be available to you in the chat. Um, today, we have the pleasure of hearing them speak about Too Beautiful to be Named, which was an installation project of new artworks and archival materials and a live memory sharing event, which animated the archives of Moming, a dance center for training and avant-garde performance in Chicago. So thank you both so much for being here and I will happily hand the mic over to you now. Thanks, Hallie. Um, hey, Mateus. <laughs> uh, I think I'll kick things off really quickly here um, before we get to a show and tell from Mateus. Um, but thanks everyone for being here. Thanks to Dance USA and the Ohio State University for hosting this. Um, as Hallie said, I'm Janae, I'm the director of CDHP. Um, I'll answer to whatever pronouns you want to use. I am a Caucasian woman uh, sitting in a living room in Chicago, and I just found my pen in my pulled back hair. Um, CDHP acknowledges that Chicago is the unceded homeland of many tribal nations, including the Council of the Three Fires, the Miami, and the Menominee, and we respect the indigenous people of Chicago and their contributions to our cultural life. Um, I'd like to give you just a little context about CDHP before uh, Mateus does the show and tell. 
um, because we're a little new and different. CDHP, as Hallie said, is a digital archive. It's an independent 501c3, uh, and we formed in 2015, um, basically because we noticed a you know, lack of broad awareness of the city's dance history and really no comprehensive means for disseminating that information. So we're not just simply accumulating an archive, but we're creating one from original research ourselves. Um, my background is as an artist and a tap dancer who's always done humanities-based research uh, to inform my practice. Um, as Hallie said, I've written books and made a documentary, and I say that because I was definitely intimidated by institutions and archives uh, in the past and had these uh, misconceptions and preconceived notions about who and what they were for uh, that didn't necessarily include me. So right out of the gate, I knew that CDHP was going to try to send the message in every possible way that it was for, by, and about anyone with ties to or interest in Chicago dance. Uh, so you know, building the archive and the organization simultaneously resembled the early stages of every research project, really um, following unexpected leads down rabbit holes, noodling around in a studio and seeing what sticks. Uh, figuring out what to say with the materials we gather. Um, and that MO has worked for us uh, so far. Uh, in six years, 230 individuals are now represented in our original collections of oral history interviews and public events. And we have 47 collections of over 60,000 files of uh, dance related artifacts. Uh, we're still collecting, of course, but now that we actually have an archive, we're also using those materials in a variety of ways, and we invite you to do the same. Um, so I've described the venue a little bit. Let me set the stage for Mateus uh, and his project. Uh, Mateus was our first intern back in the early days of CDHP. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of reasons why, but I, I really wanted to... Um, give Mateus agency to find a way of working that overlapped with his own artistic interests. And so I encouraged him uh, to find a research project that overlapped with us and his curriculum at SAIC. Uh, CDHP would support it and build our archive uh, while doing so. Um, so Mateus, why don't you take it away and tell us more about Too Beautiful To Be Named? Okay, happy to. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Mateus, I use he, him pronouns. I'm um, calling in from Lanate Hoking, uh, and I am a white trans man with red hair and a brown button down shirt. Um, I have some slides to share with you. Let me share my screen. Let's see. So, um, Too Beautiful to be Named uh, came to be because um, I stumbled across a few items from the Moming Collection at the Newberry, which is uh, a public research library in Chicago. Um, and I had never heard of Moming um, before that point, despite the fact that um, it had served as a hub for experimental dance and performance in Chicago for almost 30 years. Um, so I ended up deciding to do something with these archives, um, which were actually uh, similar to Raza's situation. They were unprocessed at the time. Um, so Janae and I were actually the first people to go through these things. They were still sort of, everything was haphazardly crammed into these file boxes as they had been received, um, like so, oops, uh, as you can see. Um, and so this was like a really rich and informative experience for me as an artist, um, getting to work with them on process collection because I sort of um, stumbled across many things that I wouldn't have probably found otherwise. Um, and one of the great things about working with a community-based institution like CDHP is that it sort of afforded me that access, which was really important to the way um, this project generated artistically. Um, so I really saw myself um, reflected in all of these materials um, 
you know, I found all of these photos of um, tired young people rehearsing in their piles of torn clothing and um, all of these sort of correspondences about where the money is coming from, who's teaching class, who's going to clean the studio, um, how much to push the envelope. Um, and, you know, even though I was in this research library um, looking through these documents, um, it sort of felt like the punk ethos uh, and the avant-garde vibrancy of Moming could really be usefully reinscribed into the present. Um, so I decided um, that I would reenact several of the archival photos. Um, I did this with my friends who were not trained dancers. And I ended up showing these pieces in a gallery setting um, mounted in large format to plexiglass and hung um, in a reference to stained glass because the, the building that housed Moning was also a church. Um, so in addition to sort of looking at these materials and creating this exhibition, um, CDHP also started conducting interviews with former Moming teachers, dancers, and administrators. Um, so this painted kind of like an even more vibrant picture of this moment in Chicago dance history for me. Um, people just had such great stories. Um, one that I particularly love was that um, most of the folks that we talked to shared some anecdote about this building being haunted. Um, and they all had sort of these similar experiences with the ghosts in the building. And they would often point to that apparition as sort of like uh, a metaphor for the energy of the time and the kind of work that was being produced and the kind of commitment to the space um, that was really cool. Um, I got so much perspective on what it was like being a dancer in Chicago uh, in this moment. Um, the ways in which people were trying to make boundary breaking work um, as uh, the AIDS crisis decimated the arts community and as public funding um, totally shriveled up. Um, the story of Mo Ming is also sort of the story of those two things. Um, let's see. Um, so I guess that brings me to some other things. Um, Many of the people that we talked to in CDHP were no longer actively involved in dance. Um, and in initiating these conversations, I kind of felt like CDHP was uncovering a facet of dance history that was really impactful to me and feels really prescient now. Um, it makes me think that dance history isn't just ephemeral because it's um, of the moment and an unrepeatable experience. Um, but also because we live in a country that is constantly foreclosing on dancers' ability to maintain the conditions under which they can make work. Um, losing access to space, losing access to uh, material support, all of these things. Um, these are things that we're encountering now, um, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic. And these are also things that I learned a lot about um, doing this research. Um, for example, the building that house Mo Ming is now luxury condos, right? We've heard this story before. And so in having these conversations and in looking at these archives, I really came to appreciate how um, the past offers solutions for like our present conditions. And um, it, can, it was really reassuring to see and talk to folks who had experienced these same circumstances 30 years prior, but had figured it out and continued to make work. Um, as part of the exhibition, we invited a lot of the folks that we talked to to come together and something that we didn't realize until it actually happened was that many of these people hadn't seen each other uh, in some 20 years since they left the collective. And so we also got to sort of absorb some of the materials from their personal collections, which you can see here. Um, the dearly departed choreographer, Charlie Vinnan, lent us his Mo Ming shirt and also some of his scores. Um, so that was a really generous aspect of that. And then um, they also kind of had like a impromptu 
conversations, sort of sharing memories about what this space meant to them, which was really beautiful to witness. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's pretty much a brief summary <laughs> for now. Um, I will add to you that it, it, was, it was actually not an impromptu conversation that was always sort of planned. Uh, we had the camera there and this project and CDHP overall, the nature of it is incredibly generative. So, you know, we were doing a lot of things with archives at once. Mateus was mining the archives of the Newberry Library, creating original material. And we were also expanding upon our archives by inviting these folks to, you know, uh, participate in a memory sharing session that was recorded as part of our oral history collection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what, Mateus, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the things we found, you know, like, I guess, surprisingly, in a way, like working with archives was actually highly collaborative, um, you know, wasn't simply a collaboration between the two of us, but, you know, with all of the folks that Mateus has mentioned who, you know, lived this history, and again, that's the point of CDHP, uh, to provide a platform for folks to tell their own histories in their own words. Um, but so, you know, I, th I think about experiences with other archives, perhaps, and there's just like even physically kind of step after step after step, um, you know, there's all these layers of distance between you and an object and uh, it's, it's harder to sort of um, remember the humanity around the archives. But with us, I mean, we just plunk ourselves right down in the middle of all of these people. And hopefully through the digital archive, um, you know, we can recreate that experience for everyone else as best as possible. Um, you know, it's a shame that everyone couldn't have been with us at that exhibition opening and in that gallery sharing that space. Um, but hopefully we can do the next best thing with the recordings and with the materials. Yeah. Um... I also like that sort of makes me think of another point that you sort of touched on earlier, which is that um, both CDH CDHP was very young when this happened. I think literally a year old. I was also very young. I was around 22. Um, and so the jet, but the generosity that we encountered in this process was just incredible. Um, people were so willing to share uh, not just their stories, but their literal like personal archives. Um, and I think that just kind of like really reinforces the point that's been made throughout this webinar, which is that people want to have these conversations and they want to make things accessible. And it's it really is possible um, to do this kind of work. And they wanna make personal connections too. And I think that was the other thing that sort of surprised me, especially with this project at how personal it became in a lot of ways and parallel, right? Like it sort of paralleled your place in your artistic explorations. As you said, CDHP was young. We were shaping an archive and an organization at the same time. And this job, you know, I've done things like this in the past, but that was new too. So I was also shaping this role. Um, and, you know, Mo Ming was a huge inspiration in that, just kind of hearing about how this ragtag group of serious yeah. artists got together and figured out a way to make something that didn't exist before. Um, you know, and that's sort of what we were doing. So it was a really pleasant surprise. And I think it actually informed, we've talked about this, the way we presented the materials too, to kind of just um, embody the, uh, you know, shades of the punk aesthetic that we found in the Moming Collective, mm -hmm. <laughs> proudly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Well, hi, Maura. Hi, this is just amazing. I really loved the slideshow and I wanna thank you both for, for taking us through just the briefest introduction to Mateus's work, to CDHP. Um, it's really inspiring. Uh, we have a few questions uh, that I would love to, to get to. And I think um, if, if all the panelists would like to start their videos, there are some questions that different people can um, can address. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll do the first one. Um, does the library help people with the task to, um, to get people permission to use materials? Um, and I think that there may be several different answers for this. So, um, so Tanisha, would you like to start? 
Sure, Mara. Um, the, the, the short answer is in many cases, yes. And I can speak specifically, obviously, to the New York Public Library. We happen to have a permissions office within the library where requests for um, materials, um, if you want them for publication purposes, can be sent to. And through the permissions office, uh, they work with the library's uh, copyright and information policy office to identify the rights holders that you would need to clear in order to get the, the copy that you need for, for your purpose. So in our case, we can definitely aid you in getting identified copyright holders that you would need to reach out to to obtain permission for you. Thank you. And I, I'll echo that and say that OSU Libraries has a similar um, office. I will put the um, website for that in the chat. Um, and so while it the ultimate responsibility for how you use the materials rests on the researchers. There are a lot of resources to help you, and that is available to anyone using the library. Um, Janae, I don't know if you have, have a different answer for this or how it works at CDHP. Case-by-case uh, -case basis, I suppose, um, but it's, it's really person to person, and basically it's me and, you know, if we have, we have agreements with different don with donors of all of our different collections. So it's, you know, case by case basis, honestly. But the good news is, is that for the most part, I mean, you know, people want to share their work. They want it out there. It's the whole proverbial tree falling in an empty forest kind of thing. Um, I will just add, of course, Dance USA is, is not an archive. We don't have our own materials, but we are very much aware that, especially during the pandemic with the shift of the dance fields to people trying to create and share things digitally, um, copyright has become a particularly thorny problem that a lot of people are struggling with. So Dance USA is working on creating some new resources and actually in partnership with um, NYPL. And um, we're looking forward to sharing those. And there's some information aimed at artists primarily, but just to help people understand the complexities around um, copyright of performance recordings in particular, which is complex. Um, I have a question um, that I would love to pose. Um, this has sort of came up in a couple of ways in both of the conversations. I know Roz, um, you spoke to this really beautifully and I think Mateus as well, but um, this sort of idea about the embodied archive and to me, what makes dance archives so interesting and, and complicated is the fact that dance itself as a live embodied art form in a sense can't be in the archive but there are all of these other ways that we can capture it so i just love to hear any of you speak a little more i know there have been a lot of really um interesting projects um i feel like in recent years trying to sort of how can we bring the embodied, the ephemeral, the personal, the body to body, how can we bring that into the archive or how can that become part of the archiving process? So if any of you have any, anything else you'd love to share, I think that's a really interesting subject. Uh, sure, and, and it's a wonderful question. Thank you, Imogen. Um, I was very moved. I, I, I am kind of eternally moved by uh, the idea of re-embodiment. And Matisse, I know that you did that in, in your project um, by re-embodying the photographs, recreating the photographs. And I think that there is something about assuming the posture, the choreography, the movement, um, uh, the carriage of the body of another life, another time, another person um, that allows you to understand the experience in a different way, to understand the, the um, 
the lived reality in a different way. Um, I once had a group of, uh, it was actually the part of the LMU Board of Trustees uh, re-embody the photograph uh, from the Lorraine Motel uh, after Martin Luther King was shot, the famous photograph of people pointing, and just had them embody it, embody this archive, this fixed photograph. And, and how does that feel? How does that um, uh, just kind of make you reapproach that moment? So, uh, Matthias, I, I'm curious what your experiences was like being back in those images. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that anecdote about the Lorraine Hotel photo. It's really incredible. Um, yeah, I completely agree with everything you're saying, obviously. I think that something that came to mind while you were talking is that um, both of these archives are in a unique position in terms of like the that, that they're subject of sort of recent history and that a lot of the people um, that are included in these works are still alive. Um, and I think that definitely informs like one's orientation towards these images. Um, I think for me, another thing that uh, was really valuable in, in this research experience was like going to the physical location of this building, um, which is now in a completely gentrified neighborhood, right? Um, as I mentioned, it's literally luxury condos now. Um, and just standing there and like trying to think about um, what it must have been like 30 years ago and how this site has changed and sort of trying to honor um, the people that passed through that space. Um, I was originally going to reenact the photos in the building, but I couldn't figure out how to get in. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that felt like relevant to me as well. Um, and also the opportunity to have conversations with the people who were in these photographs um, was really crucial and um, definitely changed my relationship to their, the archive. Thank you so much for that. I um, very regrettably have to say that we have to wrap up. Um, this hour has flown by and just spurred so many questions for me and I think um, I think attendees as well. Um, the question that wasn't answered in the q and I will um, address by email. And I hope that some new connections have been formed today and that people will follow up. Um, this has been amazing. Thank you so much to our panelists, our interpreters, our captioners, and to Dance USA um, for, for this event today. A recording will be sent out um, if you had to go or you missed um, some of this. So um, watch your email for that. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day.